So John chapter 1, verses 16 through 18 reads, Out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father <clears throat> excuse me, has made him known. So I'm going to do a quick review real quick of the past couple of messages that we've done. Um, aside from Mother's Day, uh, we've been doing a four-part series which I've simply titled, What the Bible is All About. And uh, the first week that we did, you might remember, uh, the title of it is, It's All About Credibility. And so what that message was about, why we choose to read the Bible versus any other religious text out there. How it is that we're able to trust the Bible uh, more than anything else. The second message in the series, series was, It's All About God. And so that was the first one told us why I read the Bible. The second one told us who the Bible is about, namely God. And that kind of goes almost without saying, but sometimes we need that reminder. Um, next week's message is going to be called, It's All About Everything. So that sounds like a very, very umbrella topic, but what it's really about is about applying the Bible to everyday circumstances. No matter what the circumstances, I personally believe that the Bible applies to everything you can possibly encounter in life. And today's message, in case you're wondering, <laughs> is it's all about two promises. It's all about two promises. And uh, this is a, a very important one in scope of the entirety of the Bible because what the two promises are about is God's plan for humanity. I'll go ahead, and I was, I was going to talk about this later, but I'll go ahead and mention it since it's fresh on my mind, that uh, you might be asking what the two promises are. Well, uh, they're, they're covenants. A covenant is a special promise between God and man. When you open up your Bible, before you get into the actual scriptural text, you'll see the words Old Testament, correct? About three quarters of the way through the Bible, when you open, when you get to the, uh, well, before you get to the book of Matthew, you'll see the words New Testament. So you got Old Testament and New Testament. What's, what's this all about? Well, when you look at the original language for those words, New Testament, Old Testament, it's actually Old Covenant and New Covenant. And a covenant, as we stated, is a promise. And so when you read the Old Testament, you're reading the Old Promise of God. And when you're reading the New Testament, you're reading the New Promise of God. And within Christianity today, I think that we struggle sometimes to understand the relationship between these two promises. They seem so different from one another, and so we struggle sometimes to reconcile them because the old promise seems so strange in comparison to the promise we're more familiar with in the New Covenant. Well, let me provide you with, a, uh, with an illustration to kind of help you out to understand the relationship between these two promises, the old one and the new one. And it takes me back a number of years to the days when I was back uh, at Cleveland State University in an organic chemistry laboratory. Okay, so I took some difficult courses at Cleveland State, uh, and I wasn't particularly good at labs, by the way. Uh, but <clears throat> we had a saving grace inside the class. Before every laboratory period, we had a quiz. And the quiz was pretty much pass or fail, and only one or two questions. And so if you got them all right, you got an A. If you missed one, you got a 50%. You failed. If you missed both, you got zero. Or if it's just one question you and you missed, you fail. Well, I did pretty good overall until this one day I read the question, and it asked us to draw a specific piece of lab equipment. And my mind went blank. I could not think of what this piece of lab equipment was worth the life of me. So I just drew the first thing that came to mind. Okay. The next lab period, the professor went to hand back our quizzes. But before handing them back, he uh, said he had to explain what he did with the grades because there was a problem. Only one person in the entire class got the question correct. Okay. 
you're probably thinking, oh, that's you. No, <laughs> it was not me. <laughs> and you'll find out why here in a second. Uh, so, uh, so what he decided to do is that for those who did not attempt the question, who just left it blank, you got a zero. You didn't try. For those who attempted and drew something, you got a C. And obviously the person who got it correct got 100%. So I was a little bit excited now because I'm like, you know, this is going to be interesting. What is he going to give me a C then and when I didn't earn it? And uh, you might be thinking, well, yeah, of course he's going to give you a C. You, you drew something. Well, let me explain to you what I drew. I drew the first thing that came to mind. I don't know if you can see this, but I drew a nice cozy house. Okay. I labeled it house, by the way, because we're supposed to label things in labs. Drew a stick figure version of me, labeled it me, playing with my dog. He doesn't look like that, by the way. He didn't look like that back then. Wrote dog. And then to cap it all off, I had a nice, bright, shiny sun with a smiley face looking down on us as we were playing. Labeled it sun. And I was very blessed and happy to see that the professor added one more piece to my picture. A big red C above the sun. <laughs> It was the most gratifying C I'd ever gotten in my entire life. As uh, you see, I didn't put really, I mean, I put effort, so to speak, into it, but not in relation to the question. So what does this story teach us about the relationship between the old promise and the new promise? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> the old promise is very much like the grading scale. The grading scale was in place. If you miss the question, you got 0%. I mean, by all justice, if you don't get it right, you don't get it right. The students who did not attempt the question, they are like people who were unrepentant. They didn't make any sort of effort to present themselves uh, to the one who was doing the judging. Okay, they, just, they instead decided to be prideful about it and say, I'm not going to put anything down. I'm, ex I'm extrapolating their emotions by way a little bit. <laughs> they maybe weren't necessarily that way. Uh, so they got a zero because they had no interest in pleasing the person who's grading the, grading the papers. For those who attempted, they're like the repentant. The, they didn't deserve the grade that they got. But because they were acknowledging their failure to prepare by drawing the wrong picture, or in my case, a very awesome picture, <laughs> that, uh, uh, that the professor granted them grace. And of course, that one person would be very much symbolic of Jesus, that he fulfilled the requirements of the test and got a 100%, and so didn't need any help in the final judgment. And the professor, of course, who showed us the grace, was showing us very much a, a, a picture very similar to the new promise that we have, that you don't deserve it, but if you just simply have faith, I will give you the grace that I want to give you. And so it's a very interesting illustration. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about specifics of the old law and the, new, the, the, the old promise and the new promise as well. And so we get to have this picture in our mind of this classroom and passing and failing and that there's always going to be this standard that needs to be met if you want to be good enough for God, but that everybody just has this problem that just can't quite seem to hit the mark. Well, we don't want to miss the point of the old promise. The old promise was never about making people righteous. The old promise was never about making people righteous. Instead, what the old promise was about, the one that was given through Moses, was about exposing the reality that we're all sinners, that we can't achieve God's perfect standard by our own efforts, no matter how hard we try. Romans makes this very specific, but also when you think about it, it was there to expose our sins, not so we could wallow in them, but that so we could take action of some sort. And the action that they gave in the old promise was a sacrificial system. You commit a sin, you make a sacrifice. You make atonement for the sin. You, you pay back your debt of sin through some sort of action. And what this ultimately does, though, 
is it doesn't give us salvation. We don't earn our salvation through that, but instead it points us in the direction of the person who would make the ultimate sacrifice, who would provide us with salvation, that of course being Jesus. And so we see that despite the fact that this old law that was given by Moses is always going to exist, that Jesus took care of that. And so let's move in a little bit to the, uh, well, I also, sorry, I almost got ahead of myself there. I just want to talk about some realities concerning the old law and how it was prophesied. Because some people would say, well, oh, the transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament. It's a lot like, for instance, Hinduism tran uh, transforming into Buddhism or transitioning into Buddhism, uh, where Buddha got fed up with the way that Hinduism was operating and said, I don't really like the caste system. I want to create a religion where I'm going to toss out the caste system. That's not what Jesus did. In fact, Jesus loved the law. He honored the law. He even says that he did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And on top of that, and this is where it gets kind of confusing, he says that anybody who would teach against the law would be called on least in the kingdom of heaven. And so he made it very, very clear that his purpose was not to destroy the law, not to throw it out, not to found some sort of new religion, but instead he came to honor the law himself and to give himself up as a sacrifice so that we wouldn't be held by the standards of the law, regardless of their continuous existence. The purpose of the new promise, the purpose of the new promise, we don't want to get this wrong either. It's not something that makes us righteous in ourselves, but it confirms our failure and our need for a Savior. So remember that illustration I just gave about the classroom. None of us deserve that C, <laughs> that glorious C that we got on our quiz, but instead it was administered through grace. And that's what the new promise does, is when you look at the Sermon on the Mount, for instance, Jesus outlines all these moral codes concerning what we should be doing with the law. The Pharisees thought that they were living perfectly, but when they saw what Jesus had to say about, you see it was written, or you heard it said, and then he would come back and say, but I tell you, they found out that they were not fulfilling the law the way that they thought they were, because God wasn't just looking at their actions, he was also looking into their hearts. And so the new promise confirms our failure in in reminds us of our need for a Savior. Also, the new promise announces God's grace through the forgiveness of sins. That was a constant uh, uh, reminder from Jesus throughout his ministry on earth that he came to preach about the forgiveness of sins. One of the most memorable moments in his ministry was when a man was lowered down. They tore the roof off of a building when they knew that Jesus was preaching there. They lowered this man who couldn't walk down into the building and the first thing that Jesus says to him, they were expecting him to heal the man right away. But instead, what he did is he told him that his sins were forgiven. It's a very important part of the New Testament is the forgiveness of sins. And he did that even before healing the person. And it almost looked like he wasn't going to heal the person until somebody questioned his authority to forgive sins. And so he told the man, all right, they need a sign. Get up and walk. And so he walked away confirming that indeed Jesus didn't just heal him, forgave his sins. That's the most amazing part about that particular story. And ultimately, what also did that do? It didn't just show the forgiveness of sins. It also, the New Testament, as well as this example, revealed the identity of God's chosen Savior to the world. And so the scene of John the Baptist baptizing Jesus and the heavens opening up and, a, and the Spirit of God descending upon him as a dove, this was a sign that Jesus is the promised Messiah. That was prophesied from all the way back in the Old Testament. That's, that's the biggest difference between Christianity and other religions is that it was already prophesied that this uh, new promise would be made. And we see this in... Ezekiel, when he tells people that he would replace their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh, that they would be his people and he would be their God and they would walk in righteousness according 
to his ways because he would be the one fulfilling the promise this time around. And so the work's already been done for us. We've already acknowledged the fact that we fall short. We've seen that God has told us about the forgiveness of sins, and we've acknowledged Jesus as the Savior to the world. So how do we apply this to our lives starting today? Well, it can be difficult to understand exactly what to do with a message I think so thick in content. But the Bible reminds us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 not to regard people from a worldly point of view. I don't know if you've seen the stories talking about, and I'm, I'm not trying to demean this, but uh, putting the Ten Commandments up in public schools. Just bitter fighting over this topic. And I, I, I'm under the conviction this need not be. I love the Ten Commandments. I love God's law. Nonetheless, should we be holding people that don't believe in God's law to the standards of God's law? And I say absolutely not. We need to be people of grace because we've been shown grace. It's not because of our living up to the law that we're made right with God, but instead we oftentimes come to God. Most of the times we come to Jesus because of the way that somebody else loved us, forgave us, showed us grace when we just didn't deserve it. And so this is my charge to you this morning. Live as children of God who have been shown grace. And that's all. Let's conclude this message in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for not just your new promise, but your old promise as well. Lord, as we know that without this old promise, we might not be aware of our failures to meet your righteous standard. So many times we fall short in our own lives, and we just so desperately need to be reminded of your grace, your love for us, and you've done so through Jesus. And Lord, just in this children's message this morning, you are not a God who leaves us wondering. But instead, when you wiped out the population of the world and left Noah, his family, and a couple straggling animals, you put the rainbow in the sky to remind us that you're there, to remind us of your love. We thank you for the work that you've done in showing us the way to salvation and reminding us through your word what all you've done to remind us of that and to give us confidence in the hope that you've promised to us, Lord. Thank you for the two promises that you've given us. Thank you for the grace and truth administered through Jesus Christ, your Son. We pray this all in his name. Amen.